Today we have my friend Frank, uh, who is um, who will be chatting with our our guest, uh, our special guest, uh, Dr. Paul Gilbert. And I'll just tell you a little bit about Frank. Frank is the co-founder of the Belfast Black Mountain Zen Center. He is also the co-founder and pres- present chair of the Compassion City Belfast, which was founded in 2013 with Dr. Jim Dotty of Stanford. Stanford or Stanford. Frank's recovery date is 22nd of June 1993 and owes his life to the AA Fellowship. Here, here. Um, Dr. Paul Gilbert is a clinical psychologist, author and founder of the Compassionate Mind Foundation. And Paul is the founder of Compassion Focused Therapy CFT, Compassionate Mind Training CMT, and author of books such as Compassionate Mind. Um, a new approach to life's challenges to overcoming depression. So over to you, Frank, wherever you are, I can't see you. I'm here, I'm here, can you see me now? Okay, okay, and uh, thank you very much indeed for the invitation and a big, big thank you and a big honor for to, uh, to get for your good self, Dr. Gilbert. You know, uh, I'm a great fan of yours, a great fan of the work that you do. Uh, so a wee bit about me at the moment is that uh, my name is Frank, Frank Liddy, uh, recovering alcoholic based in Belfast. I'd like to ask you some questions. And the first question I'd like to ask you, uh, Dr. Gilbert, would be, you know, a bit of a legend tour as to what has brought you to where you are today. If that was possible. Yes, thanks, Frank. That's a lovely question. And just call me Paul. That's, that would be lovely. Um, <clears throat> so... Um, <clears throat> A lot of things, really. Um, I obviously have been very interested in helping people with mental health problems. That's obviously one key thing. Uh, I've had a long-term interest in Buddhism since my teenage years. And uh, the Beatles, the Maharishi, and and smoking a few nice things, all that sort of stuff. Uh, And then I became very interested in the Buddhist concepts of compassion. Um, And then gradually became more and more concerned with the fact that the human mind is capable of some just extraordinarily terrible things. We are possibly the most vicious, sadistic, nasty species that have ever existed. If you look at the history of the last 10,000 years, we've engaged in you know the gladiatorial games, crucifixion, of course, uh, terrible tortures, uh, and uh, the church have been part of that as well, I have to say. So um, what really had a massive impact on me was in 1995, I was watching the end of the, it was the 50th anniversary of the Second World War, and I watched a three-hour program on the Holocaust and um, some of the experiments that were done on children and things. Now, I had young children, and I have to say, I sort of cried through about two hours of that program, and I was never really the same. And I thought, you know, compassion is not just about, oh, happiness, let's be kind to ourselves, blah, 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 blah. We need compassion to address the dark side. Humans have a terrible dark side. And uh, but compassion has the power to to address that dark side because we can begin to understand why we have a dark side and what we can do to prevent it. So that was one of the formative uh, journeys I had into compassion. That's why when you see me talk, I'm always talking about compassion for the dark side. And of course, our personal dark side is when we're caught in the terrible depressions and wanting to kill ourselves because we can see no hope and and so on and so on. We can have a personal, terrible, terrible dark side, which in religion is sometimes called the dark night of the soul. And so once again, compassion is a process that can help people with their own personal dark sides. Thank you. And uh, you know, in your, on your journey, on your journey, uh, I believe we involved in, uh, was it a, uh, were you an economist before you got into psychology? Or? Yeah, well done. Well done, Ken. Yes, I was. I, uh, my first degree was in economics. And uh, now this is in 1970, I started that. And in those days, it was quite easy to get a grant to, re, to, re, to restudy. And it was, um, I'd always wanted to do psychology, but when I was doing my A-levels in the 60s, people said, oh, no, no, economics should make a lot more money and it's a much better career for you. So, uh, so I pursued that. But while I was doing my degree, I became more and more interested in psychology, more and more interested in the problems of humanity and the nature of the 
human mind. And so I was lucky enough that when I finished my economics degree, I was able to do another degree in psychology. And then um, I was able to work in a psychiatric hospital for a, uh, a while to earn money to support my studies. And then I went to Edinburgh and did a PhD on depression. So that that's that part of the story. Mm. Great part of the story. And tell me, please, when it comes to compassion, you know, the great Karen Armstrong, who we had in Belfast not too long ago, uh, you know, and she had written a fantastic book on the, you know, the, the golden rules, the, the 12 rules for, uh, for compassion. But, you know, when I listen to Karen speak and when I, when I look into compassion, it seems that there's many different interpretations of compassion. I was just wondering, what would your definition of compassion be? Yeah, it's a wonderful question, uh, Frank. Um, yes, so Karen's been very interested in the spiritual traditions of compassion. And spiritual traditions of compassion are very interesting because the spiritual conditions uh, of compassion, obviously you've got the Buddhist position, but within the Christian uh, uh, story, it's very much about courage and wisdom and sacrifice. Now, today in the West, the middle classes have got hold of compassion. It's about being kind, blah, blah, blah. But don't think, I mean, that's okay. I'm all in favor of that. But really at the heart of the spiritual traditions is this concept of sacrificing yourself for the benefit of the other. That is the Christian story, right? That's the key issue. And if we live the Christian story, compassion is always about the focus on the other, the focus on the other. And in the Buddhist traditions, it's the same, the focus of the other. May I you know, bring compassion to you? It's not just about bringing compassionate to me. And um, Karen is very much into that tradition. And she talks a lot about the golden rule, Confucius, you know, do unto others as you would have done to yourself. So that's, I think, a, a really fundamental issue. And I have to say that a lot of individuals who believe themselves to be Christian and following a compassion tradition are not. Uh, I think in many of us, and I'm sure you would agree with us, that for those of us who support, you know, tax cuts for the rich and all the rest of it, I think you'd have a lot of trouble if you was to go to heaven and meet Jesus. And he says, what? So what did you do for the poor and the sick? And, and you say, well, actually, I was in favor of tax cuts for the rich, you know, because I rather like my yachts, you know. I like my fast cars. I think they were lovely, you know. I think Jesus wouldn't look terribly kindly on those sort of principles. So um, the key thing then is really how do we stimulate this idea of compassion for, for others? So how do I define it? Well, there are different ways in which we can look at this. So one of the things that I'm interested in is the evolution of our abilities to be motivated to do certain things. So clearly we are motivated to eat, we're motivated to protect ourselves, we to protect ourselves from harm and we're motivated for sex and so on and so on. But the other thing we're motivated to do is to be caring, particularly for our own children. And all species actually, uh, particularly the mothers, but not only the mothers, care for their offspring. And we know that over millions of years, the brain has evolved a whole range of systems which allow us to be sensitive to the stress of others, i.e. the child in the first instance, and then be motivated to do something about it. So for me, compassion is rooted in these systems which we can identify in the brain, which is a sensitivity, that's the first thing, sensitivity to suffering and need in another or in the self. And then the second part of it is the desire to work out what to do. Now, for my approach to compassion, you must have the two. You know, it's no good just being sensitive to suffering, but then not knowing what to do, because then people get overwhelmed and distressed and they and they, they turn away. So compassion really is these two things. And I think within your community, the AA and so on, there's this sensitivity to suffering, of course there is, but also this element. So what is helpful to you? What can we do to be helpful? It's not just being sensitive, it's actually working out, you know, wise and practical ways to be helpful. Now that's important because compassion without wisdom can actually be harmful. You know, if I see somebody fall into a, fast flowing river and I think I must save them and I jump in to say that I can't swim. Uh, that's not very helpful. So wisdom, the wisdom of what it is that's going to be helpful is such an important thing. And that's why I think the, you know a lot of the work that you do in your communities is so important because it's helping people find the wisdom of what's helpful. What, you know, willpower is, is, particularly when it comes to addictions, 
it's very, very difficult. Willpower. It is without will. You need the wisdom to know what to do, the support of others, the, the, the compassion of others, the understanding of others, the empathy of others, the ability to pick yourself up when you've fallen over and you've gone back and all of that. That That is the wisdom and the courage of compassion that when the going gets tough, that's when compassion bites. It's not when it's easy. Compassion is when it's tough. And I've also heard it said, uh, I don't know if you agree with this here, but some people say that the Buddha himself was the first psychologist. Yep. And some people also say that the Buddha himself was the first addict, you know, who obviously designed the, uh, his program, being the, the Four Noble Truths and the, and the Eightfold Path as a way out of suffering. You know, so for me, especially when it comes to someone uh, who's in recovery, is there anything that we can do as individuals to cultivate compassion? Yes, very much so. Now, the Buddhist story is a very interesting story and a very different to the Christ story. And I think this is why different spiritual traditions bring different wisdoms. So you probably know the Buddhist story that the Siddhartha, who was um, born as to, into, a, into a leading family, his father was... Uh, in, I think it was Rajasthan or maybe somewhere up north in uh, Nepal or whatever, but he was a warlord basically. And um, he wanted his son to follow him as to, as to be a great leader. But at his birth, um, soothsayers said, your son will be a great leader, but not, he will not be an army. He won't amass an empire in the way that you want. He will be a spiritual leader and he will die in poverty. <laughs> his brother said, oh, no, 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 we don't want any of that spiritual suffering stuff. And so he built golden temples and palaces for Siddhartha, his son, to grow up in. And uh, had all the, was surrounded by young people. He never saw any disease or, or whatever. And he could have as much wine, women, and song as he wanted. But uh, as he became late adolescent, early 20s, he started to think, is that all that there is then? Is there, is there nothing else? Because although I, I'm in this pleasure place, it's kind of meaningless. And so the real hero of the story actually is a, a, an attendant or a servant because he spoke to a servant. And he said, what lies beyond the walls of this golden palace? And the servant says, oh, it's a very different life. It's a very different world to what you're used to. And uh, he managed to persuade the servant to take him out of his golden palace. Right. So one night they snuck out of the golden palace and the servant, the, the attendant, took him down to the, the village. And the first thing he encountered, as the story goes, was uh, somebody who was very old and bent over a walking stick. And Siddhartha had never seen that. And he said to the attendant, what's, what, what's this? What's happened to this person? And the and the attendant said, oh, this is aging, Siddhartha. This is what happens to all living things. All living things will age and decay and grow old. And Siddhartha said, even me? And the attendant says, yes, even you. It is the destiny of all living things. And the story is that Siddhartha was overcome with the pain of aging that he cried. The next thing that he saw, somebody was in terrible pain, was clearly ill and diseased and covered in sores and things. And um, Siddhartha said to his attendant, so what's this? What's happened to this person? Because he'd never seen this. And the attendant said, this is sickness and disease, Siddhartha. And this is, we are all living things are vulnerable to this. He said, even me? And the attendant said, yes, he even knew Siddhartha. And he was so overcome with the suffering of this person that he cried. And then he saw a dead person. And he said, well, what? this person's on the street. He seems, what, what's happened? And the attendant said, this person has died, Siddhartha. All living things will die. Nothing lives forever. All living things will decay. All living things are vulnerable to illness and sickness. And all living things die. And he said, even me, even you. So those were the three big issues of suffering, the reality of the inevitability of suffering in this life. No one escapes from this reality. And then coming down the road, he saw a sadhu, a holy man, dressed in the robes. And Siddhartha said, well, who's he? And the attendant said, that's a holy man. He is trying to understand how can we deal with the terrible suffering in the world and how can we find meaning and so on. And Siddhartha said, okay, so then that's what I must do. And and he never went back. He did not come back. <laughs> I have to say, if it was me, I would have gone back to the wine and the song. You know, I would have said, oh, that's, that's enough. I'm, I'm out of here. I'm going back to uh, to my golden palace. But, so the story is that Siddhartha didn't do that. And he realized that 
that actually he'd been living the fantasy. And in this fantasy of uh, beauty, about all, all this stuff, he'd actually been living in a world that denied the realities that all of us, all of us are vulnerable to aging and decay, and all of us are vulnerable to sickness, and all of us will die. And so he then said, okay, so we must try and work out how do we address the nature of suffering? How do we deal with the nature of suffering? And so that's what he set out to do. So that's a very interesting story, I think, in terms of penetrating the fact that we can live in an illusion of grandeur stuff. But in the end, we're all on the same journey. None of us will escape this journey. And therefore, the more that we can work on those processes as up but also reach out to others who are on that journey so for example covid is an example of disease but collectively we were able to develop a vaccine now we could only do that you know because we pulled collectively and then we distributed the vaccines i mean the, the pharmaceutical companies have been a bit naughty but so when we pull together when we work together when we come together to address suffering you know, medicine in particular, uh, we've had some fantastic successes, you know, we, for, we forget this. Um, so that's the story of, of, of the Buddha. Mm. Thank you for that, Dar. Uh, so then, Paul, you know, as a psychologist and under like CFT, how would you view addiction? Well, I think the key thing with addiction is the first thing with addiction is it's not your fault. Right. That's the very first thing. It is not your fault. Look, the way we see it from an evolutionary point of view is all living things just arrived here. No living thing chose to be what it was. No elephant chose to be an elephant. A lion didn't choose to be a lion. It's prey didn't choose to be its prey. All of us are built by DNA. They we're all biologically built machines. We come into existence. We live for a while. We decay. We die. None of us choose any of that. So we don't choose the structure of our body. We don't choose the fact that we have to eat or that we have to breathe. We don't choose the nature of our brain, that we have the potential for great joy, but we also have the potential for anxiety and fear and rage and violence. Every human being has a brain that's capable of all of these things. We, we don't choose that. And we don't choose the dark side generally. I mean, sometimes perhaps, but you know, if you get caught in a depression, suicidal depression, you haven't chosen that. You haven't woken up in the morning and thought to yourself, you know what? Life is very boring. I think I'll have a suicidal depression. I think I'll practice. How can I get a suicidal depression? You know what? I, I, I'm having too much fun. I need to practice panic attacks. I'm going to go and learn how to have a scare the shit out of myself. I've got to learn how to do that. None of us choose to have these things that happen to us, right? None of us choose to have the genes that make us vulnerable to cancer if you smoke. You, some people get lung cancer, other people won't, they'd be absolutely fine. None of us choose to have genes that can make us much more vulnerable to obesity. None of us choose to have genes that can make us vulnerable to certain forms of addiction and make certain forms of addiction. And none of us choose to have minds that are in turmoil at times where alcohol is a release. You know, it is a release, it makes you feel better. And you didn't create the brain state where alcohol would do that, okay? Mm. So that's the first point, really, because I think if we can deal with the shame aspect of it, you know, that people say that no, this isn't my fault, but I didn't choose it. But what can I learn to do to help myself? So rather than criticizing and blaming myself and feeling bad because I've got an addiction and some of the things that I might have done, like stealing or whatever, to get money for my addiction. Let me first say, look, I, I didn't really choose to have a life like this. But what I can do is start to understand my mind and at such that I can begin to work with what's troubling me, what's causing me this addiction. I'm not going to blame myself for it, but I am going to take responsibility for it. And that's a really important thing. You know, there are so many things in life that it's not our fault, but uh, we need to take responsibility to do things. For example, if you're if you parked your car in a car park, somebody smashes into you and drive up, drives up. That's not your fault, right? But unfortunately, you're the only one that's going to fix it. Nobody else is going to fix it. You have to do it, right? It's not your fault you have this problem. But unfortunately, you're the only one that can really help you get out of it and with the help of others, such as the wonderful organizations that you're involved with. So that's, for me, the first stage. Once people give up shaming and blaming, 
that's the first stage and the second stage is okay so let me just think what what is this about what is it that's causing me to engage in this addiction and so forth what's happening to me what am i getting out of it and so on and so on and then you know if i can begin to reduce it and give it up what how am i going to do that what do i what what are the challenges that i will face and who will help me face those challenges so there's a series of stages but i mean as you know can the first stage with uh, uh, addictions is really the shame of it because people are very ashamed of their addiction and of course that the shame drives the addiction so then paul uh you know as a child i was born into an alcoholic home my mother was alcoholic mm. she was sober in 1969 died about two years ago and she was 51 years sober when she died uh, and i remember my father who's no longer with us but I remember my father's biggest fear was that I also would be alcoholic. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I remember, at, you know, uh, one time being in the out of man on holiday with him and he tried his best to teach me how to drink, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, he himself uh, was also a musician. So he brought me to a bar and, you know, he bought me a bottle of beer and he had a bottle of beer and he poured beer and he said, you know, he said, son, sometimes, you know, people want to get you more drink, but, you know, you know, what I would do is I would just fill the glass, you know, halfway up and let them know that you have a drink and just keep the other half bottle, you know, for later. And he, he says, you know, and what I would do, he says with the beers, I would just take a sip to wet my lips because you played saxophone. Yeah. Now, you know, the alcoholic of my type, right, and listen to my father and have the respect for my father, whenever I lifted that glass of beer, right, I didn't sip it. I threw it into me. You with me? So there's something about there's something about when I look at addiction, right? You know, within, within myself, right? Is that you know that I'm part of over that addiction. So there's a part of me wants to stop, you know, and there's a part of me can't stop. And then if we look at our good friend, you know, Carl Jung himself, you know, he would he would talk about uh, when it comes to say uh, alcoholism that it takes like a fourth dimension, you know. So he talks about, you know, having had a spiritual awakening. So what I'm thinking about, you know, when it comes to spiritual awakening, for me, I would say that the sort of the, the lotus flower of a spiritual awakening would definitely be compassion. You know, because the way that I'm sort of viewing alcoholism now is, is like the four noble truths. So first there is suffering. So me, I'm suffering. Second is the cause, oh, and drinking, right? The third is that sort of realization, you know, and the cessation of that, of, of that suffering. And then the fourth would be that transformation of suffering, as in, you know, I then reach out to other people. But I'm just wondering from a compassionate, uh, you know, focused approach, especially when it comes to, you know, step 11 within AA, it says sought through prayer and meditation, right? And the sort of a question I around was, is there a way, you know, that we can cultivate uh, compassion? Is there a way that we can generate compassion you know, how do I how do I take care of me in order to take care of others? I think it's a wonderful question, Ken. So the first thing we have to understand, we're all biologically different. Okay, so um I'm slightly on the addictive side of things. My wife can have one gin and tonic and that's fine, she doesn't want another one. But uh, if I have a couple of vodkas, that <laughs> that's enough to start me. Oh, maybe three and maybe four. So I have to be very careful. I have to be cautious about that. For some of us, when we have a drink, it really stimulates the desire to drink more. Whereas other people, they can have a drink and that's great and they get the feeling. So there are biological differences and we have to appreciate that. We have to understand that. And that's part of the thing. Same as my wife is diabetic, so she has to be very careful with her sugars, whereas I don't. I'm not a diabetic. I can eat chocolate and doesn't thing. But if she does, she's, it's problematic. So we all have these different biological systems that we have to be aware of now the key thing is firstly that's not your fault but it's the same with smoking some people have got a very low sensitivity to lung cancer they get lung cancer very easily whereas other people can smoke and not so much so we have to understand then that we have a vulnerability that's the first thing and that we didn't choose that but we do and what you say is absolutely right that some of us when you start to drink it you just want to continue. I mean, it, there, it's sort of like the doors open and away you go. So helping you deal with 
that kind of stuff. So before we get into blaming and shaming, just realizing what you're up against. Okay. That then gives you the courage and wisdom to think, okay, so it's not my fault, but because I have this vulnerability, I need to work specifically hard to try and, and, and not drink because drinking is, it's, it really triggers things in my brain, you know, didn't choose for it to do that, but it does. And then, of course, for some people who have trauma in the background and so forth, that all adds to that mixture. But the first thing I think that you're saying is recognizing that you do have a problem. That's the first thing, because, as you know, often people on the early stages of a drink difficulty don't want to acknowledge that. But that's very, very important to acknowledge that actually I do have a drink problem. And then beginning to think, okay, so what would help me? And the compassion is that question. So what would help me? What would help me? Who would help me? And we then reach out, like with the AA and so on, to find those that are supportive and caring. And so compassion for others and being able to take compassion from others, that flow of compassion between oneself and other people, that's a really healing process i mean you know self-compassion is all very well but what's really important is the experience of the community that understands you that supports you that's been to those dark areas that have been in those places where you're just you can't remember from one day to the next what we've, what's been happening those individuals are just like gold dust really and that is what gets us through that real sense of of being understood and cared for by other people that's compassion and then my next question would be, uh, I've heard some people say, well, a good friend of yours, a good friend of mine, Dr. Jim Doty uh, from Stanford University, who sends his regards. Uh, you know, it's, for me, there's something about, you know, a practice. You know, in step 11, we say, sought through prayer and meditation. So there's something about, you know, a practice like a mindfulness practice, you know, can uh, cultivate compassion you know let's say for instance if mindfulness was a candle then compassion would be the flame are you with me yep. yeah and and what i'm also mindful of is that you know it wasn't really about my drinking right it was more about my thinking you know i drank to what they would call blackout you know you know us in, in the 12-step program would be aware of you know drinking for, for to, to blackout and it, it was like it was always on the run from me, you know. But what I what I'd really like to know is, you know, do you have any advice, you know, beyond like forgiving ourselves? But would you have any advice as to what we can actually do as a daily practice, you know, to cultivate uh, compassion towards ourselves? Well, it's a wonderful question again because the first thing is I think recognizing that it would be useful to do. Okay. So when we're working with our clients, the first thing is helping them see that because sometimes they say, oh, well, yeah, that's okay. I can't see how compassion is going to help me. What, you know, what, what, I, got, I got too many problems. Compassion is too wet. It's too weak. It's not really, you know, but it, so the first thing is helping people understand that compassion actually is one of the most courageous and most wise of all of our motivations. You know, compassion is what, enables a firefighter to go and risk themselves saving somebody you know compassion is this sensitivity to suffering and the determination to do something about it so there's nothing weak about compassion so the first thing really is helping people understand what compassion is it's a real determination to address suffering and the causes of suffering so that's the first thing so the second thing is then then helping people think about so how am i going to do that now you have quite rightly said the importance of mindfulness why is mindfulness important mindfulness is important because it helps us pay attention to what's happening in the mind right because if you're an automatic pilot you're just not paying any attention so one of the examples that's often used is that sometimes we can drive home in the car and we can't actually remember how we got home because we've been thinking about this and thinking about that and blah 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 and we just suddenly find we've got home if something happens on the route like somebody jumps in front of us or something our attention is suddenly clicked onto the thing so mindfulness really helps us to pay attention to what's going on in our minds it helps us to pay attention to what we're feeling what are we thinking are those thoughts and feelings helpful or are they not now if we decide that they're not 
then we can make a decision to change. So we know that a lot of people who have mental health problems, they ruminate about things that cause them pain. They ruminate about their losses or their hopelessness or their shame or anger or vengeance or whatever it is. So mindfulness allows us to pay attention to what's happening in your mind. So a, a, an easy way of doing this is to learn how to become an observer. So you can sit, for example, and learn to observe your observe the breath, just breathing in and out. Just pay attention to paying attention. You can uh, deliberately choose to pay attention to remember a holiday you've been on, but then observe yourself remembering that holiday. In other words, all of us have a capacity to observe what's going on. We can pay attention to what's going on. So when you're eating, pay attention to what you're eating. Pay attention to what does it actually taste in your mouth. Don't just put it in your mouth and carry on chatting to people and you're an automatic pilot, but pay attention to what does that taste like? What does it feel in the mouth? So paying attention to what's actually happening in your mind and happening around you is very important because when you pay attention, that's what gives you choice. If you're not paying attention, then you're an automatic pilot. So if you get angry, an automatic pilot, you just become angry and aggressive. But if you're paying attention, you can say, ah, I'm getting angry now, so, and I'm beginning to feel aggressive. I don't want to be like that. So I'm just going to slow myself down, take a breath. Okay, I'm not going to let anger control me. I'm going to control it. And that's what mindfulness allows you to do. Rather than you being controlled by your emotions, your anxiety or your rage or your aversion, your mindfulness allows you to pay attention. My mind now is moving into an angry state or an anxious state or a depressed state, but I don't want to follow it. So now I'm observing it. And as the observer, I can say, mm, OK, but I'm not going to go there. So mindfulness is crucial to paying attention to what's happening to you as it's happening to you that's really really crucial and then the next thing is that when you've perceived yourself to be blown by the winds and storms of your mind into rage or fear or depression or whatever or trauma memories or whatever it is your mind then can bring to compassion so how can i bring compassion to this suffering mind my mind is suffering right now how can I bring compassion to it? How can I learn not to blame myself, to realize I didn't choose any of this, to realize that I could just hold it compassionately and I can allow myself just to sail through the storm of my mind, right? So mindfulness is absolutely crucial. So the, the, the exercises that you can do are learning how to pay attention. And there are exercises such as learning just to sit quietly for a few minutes and just pay attention to your breathing and just notice how your mind wanders off, but then bring it back, bring it back, bring it back, very gently. Learning how to pay attention to the senses, your senses, what you eat, what it's like to walk, what it's like to smell the air, what it's like to see the clouds and the sky above you. Bringing yourself into the present moment, learning to be attentive to what's going on in this moment, not lost in thoughts and emotions. And ah, tomorrow I've got to do this and I didn't do that. And oh, I was supposed to. And then I'm so cross with Jane and blah, 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 blah. All of that, chatter, 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 chatter. Mindfulness just says, whoa, come to this moment. Pay attention, just pay attention to what's going on in your sensory world. And it slows all that down. And then the next part, as I say, is then if you are being troubled by the storms of, of uh, difficult mind states, like depression, anxiety, okay, taking a breath and think about, so what would I like to do now? What would help me in this moment? So that's the next part, right? Just shifting your mind to what is helpful to you. Excellent, excellent. And uh, I must admit, Paul, you're doing very well being questioned by a man from Belfast. <laughs> that's great. Well, you're asking great questions. <laughs> so now, now, I'd like to take you to uh, a desert island. We're going to have a bit of a, a desert island episode now. So you're off to the desert island and you're allowed one book and you can't bring compassionate mind with you. So, <laughs> so and just for anybody listening in, you know, I would recommend, I'd recommend for people to go out and, and to purchase a uh, compassionate mind by your good self. So what book would you take to a desert island? It's a fantastic question. I'd probably probably take a history book. There's a wonderful book that I really enjoyed. It's called The Discovery of the Unconscious. It's really quite a thick book, but it's a, it's written as a series of biographies, and it's about the history of the evolution of psychotherapy and 
is a lot about um, Mesmer and then on to Janet and then on to Freud and Jung. And, and there's a lot of um, biography, a lot of personal details about the family. And it's, it paints these beauty. He has a way of writing. He paints these beautiful pictures in your mind and you can just see Victorian um, places and cafes where they used to chat about these things and so forth. So I, that was a book that had a great impression on me. So if I could only buy one book, I, I take a book that creates images and memories for, in my mind. So as I was reading it, I would be taken to places and given a sense of that place and those times. Uh, I think I'd probably choose that sort of book. And that, that book's called The History of the Unconscious? The Discovery of the Unconscious by somebody called Alan Berger. It came out in 1970, so it's a bit old. And he tragically died of Parkinson's, I think. But um, it's a fabulous book. It's just written as a biography. It's just, you know, it's a, it's a history and lots of details about, you know, when Freud had this discussion and they went to dinner and they had this wine. And, you know, it's that, it's that, that sort of level. So if you like, you know, books that create images in your mind, like, you know, watching a film or something, then you'd like it. It's not a, it is very factual, but it's not written as a factual book. It's written as a history book. And tell us, Paul, please, what makes Paul Gilbert hobby? Um, so wonderful question. There's not, there's different types of happiness, isn't there? So there's the happiness for that comes from, from, from relationships and so forth. And there's uh, the happiness that comes from being able to live a meaningful life. I think I've been very lucky. I, enjoy what I'm doing. But I think what makes you really happy is seeing how um, the concept of compassion in the last 20 years is really starting to take hold. And we're beginning to move away from the idea that compassion is just about being a bit kind or whatever. That was never Christ's view. Christ's view was never compassion is just to be a bit kind. Christ's view was very, very challenging, actually, if people understand it. Um, so that that makes me happy in a meaningful sense. So there are the pleasures, <laughs> and I also I play guitar and play jazz. I love that. Um, oh. There's the family, and uh, then there's also the work. So there are lots of different types of pleasures, really. Well, uh, I also am a, a great lover of jazz, and I play the saxophone. Ah, oh, <laughs> fantastic! So please tell me, please tell me, what piece of jazz would you take with you to the island? I'd probably take Pat Metheny. Oh, really? Wow. There we go. Okay, well, Paul, 45 minutes has come past by very fast, and uh, it has really been a great honour. You know, when I was asked if I could sit in as the interviewer, and honestly, I've read your books, I follow you on the, on the YouTube, etc. And thank you for, for all, for answering all those questions and all those great ideas.